All right, I am Rachel Schuster, and this is the discussion too about Jeannie. I am the facilitator. I'm Natalie, um, Natalie Young. I'm Nicole Esperson. And I'm Jessica Wellahan. So we were gonna first start and discuss about our personal views about how we felt about Jeannie after watching the video. Would anyone like to start? I thought the video showed a whole different aspect of language development. Um, you read about a more typical, um, even children with learning disabilities aren't in the same situation that Jeannie was in. So I think it just kind of gave a whole different view. I agree with that. I think it was also um, very eye-opening to see what that type of neglect could do mentally to a child more than just the mental or emotional abuse side, the actual development of the child itself. Yes, and I um, thought it was interesting how they talked about the critical periods as well with the language um, skills. And um, that's something that I, I had never heard of this Jeannie case before, so that was interesting to me. I also thought it was interesting how her dad's history of his mental state played a big impact, like how his mother died and he just shut everyone off from the world. And how it maybe there was something wrong with his makeup that kind of maybe Jeannie had it as well. Something like that. Um, so the question was, the case of children raised without human interaction suggested that human interaction is essential for language development. What does that mean? So one connection I made with that is that um, it goes with the um, safest assumption that you're supposed to expose children, even if you think it's beyond them. And with Jeannie, she wasn't exposed to anything. And just, you know, kind of when she first came out of the house, how much language she picked up. She did plateau eventually, but she picked up a ton just because she was exposed to it and had everyone kind of given up on her and said, well, she hasn't been exposed. She's not talking. She wouldn't have had that. So just kind of that connection that the more we can interact with children and expose them to the better chance they have at kind of picking it up um, and understanding it. I had also related it to um, back in chapter 11 when we talked about the non-symbolic communications, um, more of like the eye contact, the body movement, the facial expressions, and how um, that, um, that back and forth between a baby, even though it's just facial expressions, it's really developmental to their language and their speech because that's the beginning of it. You have to stimulate that part of the brain. And like they said in the video, if that part of the brain's not stimulated, the brain actually gets smaller, it functions less and it becomes disconnected. So that's how I related it. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting, the, the part that they show, the pictures of the brain um, in the video. I had never um, really seen a comparison like that before in, re in relation to this language piece. Um, and the, um, the language development, um, the fact that she hadn't been exposed to um, really a whole lot of meaningful language and um, those critical periods, I, I felt like that was um, something that you typically wouldn't see because most children um, are exposed to language. Um, and there might be another underlying reason why they're not um, developing properly. But um, for her, because she didn't have any of those experiences, she couldn't um, gain those skills. Yeah, I kind of tied it into something like uh, you use it or you lose it. So I, whenever they were talking about the different sizes of the brain and whenever you don't use it or stimulate it, it shrinks. So it made sense that whenever she was learning, although she was like learning very fast and learning words, she couldn't do anything more than that because her brain didn't have the capability to do it because it's already, it already shrunk down from not using it. Do you think that she possibly was born with an intellectual disability? 
I, guess I think it's really hard to tell. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. I think it's, it would be difficult to rule that in or rule it out because um, there's, you wouldn't know, you know, with any type of like IQ testing or like that, how would you figure that out? The only thing that I could think of that she wasn't was that she was able to pick up words like very, very quickly. Like, and I just think about, um, like I have some students that when I teach during summer school ESY and they are, they have ID and they like still after 21 years are not able to pick up two plus two. Mm -hmm. The fact that she was able to pick up words after never hearing them so quickly, it makes me think that maybe she wasn't. Yeah, I had said the same thing. I said that I didn't actually think she would have been intellectually disabled because her ability to learn the vocab and learn the routines and the daily tasks, they were all indicators for me of at least how much she could have learned if she just had more interaction during the beginning years of her life. I think that she plateaued due to the fact that part of her brain had actually malformed and at that point where she plateaued, it met its new capacity. Yeah, I thought of it um, kind of almost like a traumatic brain injury where your brain might have been born one way, but something happened to it. But again, you can't, you can't pick up everything. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. I've, had, I've worked with um, some intellectually disabled students and a lot of them do plateau kind of the way she has. So I'm not, I'm not really sure. Um, like I, have a, I had a student last year in third grade and he was just kind of plateauing with a lot of the skills we were working on him with and he wasn't making much progress. So I'm not really sure. I guess it's a possibility. I guess I never thought about that too because I feel like, I'm, like, I feel like at high school whenever we're talking about transitioning to the next, you know, what's, what are they gonna do next? And some parents want them to be like reading at like a higher level. We're like after 21 years, if they haven't, I think that they've reached it. So maybe she did reach that plateau, the same one that other students with ID reach at some point. Right. Um, and then we talked, the last question is discussing the ethical issues related to Jeannie. So one of the issues I thought um, that was raised in this is the fact that she was kind of moved around so many times from family to family and caregiver to caregiver. And I felt like that wasn't very ethical for them to be doing that to her um, because that's, you know, she needed some stability in her life. She needed some um, like people in her life that um, were going to be there for her and just tossing her around. And then when they sent her back to live with her, um, her, mother I think it was um, that seemed very unethical as well for them to do that um, I agree especially because um, some of the caregivers were the actual scientists and psychiatrists that were doing the research on her um, I know today that would definitely not be allowed so I think that's a big ethical issue related to this study yeah, I think one of the other ethical issues um, that I found interesting was most of the time when you're studying something or there's research being done, you replicate it multiple times to see if the same things happen. And in this case, that's not possible um, because it wouldn't be ethical to expose another child to absolutely no interaction like that. So it's hard to tell if this is a case that would happen all of the time, if it's something that's more severe with Jeannie, um, you know, and, and to kind of see what would happen and what that exactly means. I feel like people didn't, um, like she was more just there for an experiment. Um, I feel like anytime, like even the, the lady um, who was working with her, even whenever she said that she hadn't had contact with her in years, the first thing that she like went to was, I don't know where her language is at. Not like, how is she doing? Is she functioning? Like, is she living a happy life? It was more of, I don't know what she's speaking. It was mm -hmm. more of just a research. Um, another ethical issue that I thought about was um, that Jeannie, when she first came out of the house, did not have um, a good vocabulary or any language. So she was really unable to 
really give consent to be studied or to be part of it. Um, and you know, today you can't do anything without having consent to do it. So that's a huge ethical issue for this case as well. It made me question like, how would something like that work if like who technically, I guess if the ward of this, she would became a ward of the state. So I guess they would have to give permission for that, I guess to happen if she wasn't capable. Yeah, and I think it's a fine line for studying what's happening to help others versus what's right for her. I think that's kind of where a big question comes into play too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, they didn't mention much about like her physical. I mean, she was smaller than um, a third. She was the size of like a six-year-old, they said, but she was 13. But they never talked about like her um, physical state either. Um, the fact that she was like tied down for so long, like hours, like that had to have, you know, disformed her body, I would think in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the video was very tailored to her speech and what she could learn still rather than her actual, what her body has actually gone through and her well-being. Is there anything else that you would like to add? 